soon. Um, or evening, whichever it may be. Uh, so we have a couple of people. We'll keep up in just a second. Uh, I invite you to ask questions. As I go through, if you want to interrupt, feel free. That's lovely. I'm here to see some questions. We have about 30 minutes or so, so I'm going to get through it as quickly as I can. Uh, you have two things there that are important. One, the PSAT scores. Two, the ACT scores. PSAT scores, unlike in the past, they changed the PSAT this past spring. PSAT scores, unlike in the past, is almost exactly the same as the SAT, right? In the past, PSAT scores used to be scored differently and a little bit harder to convert to SAT scores, but new PSAT scores, the ones that you guys just did, are almost exactly the same. So basically, if you're looking at a PSAT score, you can pretty much assume that that is what the SAT score would be had the student taken it on the same day with what they knew on that day. Let's just jump through some of this. Um, clicking. There's my email address. That's actually not my email address. They changed it. It's my full name, Phil.Bellow at I think that one works too. Let's keep flipping. Um, keep going. All right, so the PSAT report, that's the opening of it. The important thing is the access code on the front. That access code gives you access to all the questions from the test. If you want to go back and look at the question the student got wrong, they can actually use that access code, log into the college board site, and look at actual questions, which is one of the most useful things out of the PSAT. Let's keep going. Uh, so here are the things that we care about, right? The PSAT score, first thing you want to look at, let's click, is the the scores at the top. This is what colleges care about. In this example, we have a 430 and a 530, which are adding up to a 960. So to get a total score, the top score on the PSAT, anybody know? What's the highest possible PSAT score? 1520. What's the lowest possible PSAT score? No one knows? No one cares. We don't care about the lowest possible score. <laughs> Lovely. We'll keep moving. Right? Lowest possible score. Who cares? So the percentiles are also interesting because it tells you where your child stands in relation to the rest of the country. So this child was in the 51st percentile, so compared to their grade, and because it's so low, this feels like a 10th grade. I believe this is a 10th grade report I pulled up. 11th grade, the 960 is probably a little bit lower than the 51st percentile. So they compare the child to their grade level. So for a sophomore, a 960 would be the 51st percentile. Let's keep flipping. Let's get the next slide up there. Forward, forward, forward. All right, so let's see. Oh, there we go. Keep going. Keep, just keep going forward. It'll it'll do some animation and then it'll do. Whoa! I don't know what's going on with your computer there. Drop out and it takes to the next slide. Uh, okay, lovely. Keep keep flipping. Somehow we, we don't have clicker control, so it's a little bit, all my animations got messed up. I'll keep flipping, keep flipping. Let's keep going, keep going, keep going. All right, so this is this next page of your PSAT report. What matters to you, click for me, is on the left-hand side, the test scores. If colleges look at anything beside those total scores, they might look at the test scores. And this is where they start breaking down reading, writing, and math. All right, so that's also what they use to calculate national merit. So national merit calculation comes out of that. Um, all the subscores over there, almost nobody will care about, except for maybe the student. The test taker might be interested in, did I not do so well on part of algebra? That might mean I need to improve my algebra selection. But other than that, colleges will never look at test the subsection scores, so you don't have to worry about that with relation to college. That's just how you did on individual question types. Colleges probably won't go past that first slide with the big 200 to 800 numbers. All right, keep going. Um, National Merit Index. In New York City, the National Merit number was 219 index. And they arrive at that by adding those test scores and then doubling the number. So you'd add the math, reading, and writing score and double the number. And that's how you get to the National Merit Index. Last year in New York City, or for, for 2000, those who took it in 2015, the index was a, was, a, was a 219, I believe, or so. It will show there if you actually qualify for that. You probably would have heard about that already. Let's keep flipping. Um, so that's what national merit is. Everybody who takes it, they choose about 7,400 among the entire country. So it's a nice award. Not a whole lot of people get it. Don't sweat it. There's lots of other scholarship opportunities. Not 
Masters in National Merit, and most scholarships are not tied to the PSAT. So don't kill yourself over National Merit if you haven't qualified for it. If there's a 10th grader who's close to it, then maybe they should prep and think about it. But if you're an 11th grader and you didn't qualify for it, there's lots of other opportunities. Let's keep flipping. Keep going, keep going. Let's hit the next slide. All right, so the cool thing I like about the PSAT, now you can't do this out of the paper, but this is what I was talking about, you can go into a question. That's actually question one from the PSAT in October. If I go online, I can click question one and bring it up on the screen and actually look at it with an explanation and see what I got right and what I got wrong. That's gonna be the most useful page for most students because you're thinking about what am I going to do to change my SAT score? So pulling that out of the PSAT report and going online to look at the actual questions is a, is a nice thing to be able to do. Let's keep going. All right, the three things that are on the report, right answer, student's answer, and then the difficulty level of the question. Keep going. I don't know what the computer doesn't like about those things. All right, let's keep flipping to the next slide if we can. Okay, the ACT report, very similar information. So this report is not an actual ACT. You guys took an actual PSAT and then a Princeton Review Practice ACT. The information you get from both is about the same. ACT is scored slightly different. Top ACT score, anyone? 36. 36. Bottom ACT score? Yeah. Again, we don't care. Right, bottom scores aren't something we're interested in. Percentile is a good thing to know about. 92nd percentile for this student who got a 29. All right, let's keep flipping. Um, the right wrong blank will be on that second page here where green means right, obviously. Red means wrong. If there's a letter underneath the red, that says the letter the student put down. All right, let's keep turning. And then there's subcategory stuff that's there as well, in case you want to break it down, what types of stuff am I getting right or wrong? All right, let's keep going. So what does all of this mean to us? All right, turn for me. Um, that's right, so then the, the, the big thing to start looking at, flip the slide. Um, keep going. All right, so all of this is getting messed up. Let's keep going, going. Just go, go, go. Oh, uh, this is all messing up all my fun here. All right, keep yeah. going, keep going. So we'll just go here. Okay, so then from the scores, right, one of the things, the most important thing for you guys to start looking at is stuff like this. What do the scores mean with regards to college? SAT scores and ACT scores are irrelevant if you aren't looking at them in context of college. Right? Is a 29 a good ACT score? Yes or no? What if you're applying to Columbia? No. What if you're applying to Fresno? Yeah, so good or not is entirely relative to the colleges you're applying to, all right? So what you're looking at is what do my scores mean at the schools that I want to go to, all right? Not what do my scores mean versus my friend, what does it mean versus mom or dad, it's what does it mean versus the schools I want to apply to, all right? And here are some mean scores from some randomly selected schools. So a 21 is the average ACT at Fresno State, a 29 would be amazing. Whereas Columbia, it's a 33, a 29 is less amazing. A word of caution, don't take pictures of this. Because I don't know when I put this slide together. This might be three years ago, right? It's not three years ago. But the numbers shift slightly. The other thing that I'm not putting on this slide is colleges have ranges. This is a mean score. What's really a little bit more telling is to look at the range of scores at the school. The 25th to 75th percentile probably gives you a better picture of who gets in and who doesn't, right? So take all the numbers you're given with a grain of salt. It's kind of a benchmark, right? It's saying that, roughly speaking, a 29 is good at the University of Florida. It doesn't mean if you have a 26, you won't get it. But it means, on average, the people who apply get in with a 29. Somebody probably got in at Florida with a 21, right? But they probably had a correspondingly high GPA. So understand the numbers, but take them with a grain of salt, OK? Uh, keep flipping. Uh, one of the things I do like, Prince Review, this is a screenshot from Prince Review's website. This is Yeshiva University. Um, one of the things I like about this is that they disaggregate the GPA. And all, um, so without just showing you the mean GPA, I can see what percentage of kids get in with a 3.5 versus 2.6. Right? So data like that is a little bit more telling about what actually happens. They do it with test scores as well on College Board's Big Future website. So start looking at the data, look at the information to see kind of where your scores put you and what those scores mean to you. Make sense? All right, let's keep flipping. Um, scores also can be attached to money, right? So this is why preparing for these tests are good. At these schools, and this is a random selection of schools, there are other schools with different merit scholarships. 
Merit scholarships are often tied to GPA and test scores. So at these schools, at University of Maine, right, a 24 ACT, and I don't know the GPA requirement that goes with it, but a 24 ACT gets you $10,000. That's worth studying for a few weeks, right? If I can get some merit money out of that, all right? So just be aware that the test scores often carry a little bit more weight besides just admitting some schools are going to tie money to test scores as well, all right? Let's keep going. Next slide for me, please. Lovely. To help you understand SAT versus ACT, there's a thing called a concordance chart or a conversion chart. If you look at, if you Google SAT score converter, you can find this pretty easily. I was talking to somebody earlier about what a 29 means on the ACT, and it's now hidden, I can't see it. But a 28 ACT basically converts to a 1330. All right, so when you're looking at your PSAT versus your ACT, if you grab the score converter, it'll help you put that in context. The reason that's important for you is ideally everybody will prepare for one test, not two. Ideally, you'll take the test that right now you're doing the best on. If my ACT score is here and my SAT score is there, I'm going all in preparing for the ACT, hopefully taking the ACT, being done with it, and never looking at the SAT. Colleges don't want you to take both tests. They want you to take the test that's going to get you the best number that lets them admit you. So you want to prepare for and take the test that's going to give you the best result. For a lot of you, the scores are going to be fairly comparable. If the scores are fairly comparable, then you take the test that you like best. All right? And there are a few differences among the two tests that might help determine which one you like better. But the conversion chart will help you compare your two scores, which is what all colleges do. They get an ACT score, they convert it, they convert SAT and ACT scores so that they can compare the two scores to see what they look like side by side. All right, let's keep flipping. Um, scholarships, also, not every scholarship is attached to test scores. Some scholarships have nothing to do with test scores. I love the duct tape scholarship. Anybody heard of the duct tape scholarship? Y'all should do the duct tape scholarship. If you make an outfit out of duct tape, these are made out of duct tape, and you wear it to your prom, you might win $25,000. Right. I will wear duct tape for one night to win $25,000. I'm in. All right, so not every scholarship is attached to test scores, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Let's keep going. And you can register at a bunch of scholarship search sites. Look at the scholarship search site. I Googled this this afternoon. Scholarship Jewish College. And these things came up. Right? Lots of scholarships for Jewish kids applying to college. So start Googling stuff and find scholarships. And I think almost all of these are straight up. Are you Jewish? And are you going to college? Those are our primary criteria. Which is a good place to start, especially in this school. Right, so start looking for scholarships. You've got duct tape on one end and the Jewish scholarships on the other end. I can do duct tape, I can't do Jewish. Right, so y'all win on that one versus me. Right, keep going. All right, so let's look at some differences between the tests. We'll keep going. All right, fundamentally, SAT versus ACT to me is Coke versus Pepsi, Marvel versus DC. Right, it's really the same thing, but different variation. Right? McDonald's versus Burger King. We all know they're basically the same, but Burger King's kind of nasty. Right? I personally hate Burger King and don't drink Pepsi. Right? But I love Coke because that's my preference. ACT and SAT are fundamentally the same thing. They're really the same, although you may have a strong preference for one versus the other. They're both about four hours. They, they both have about the same type of stuff, reading, math, writing and fake science, right? Neither of them have actual real science. What was the science of the ACT? Reading, reading graphs. Like really y'all calling that science, right? It's reading charts and graphs. So don't be afraid of science on these tests. Neither of them have actual legit science, right? Let's keep flipping. We'll get to a couple of more interesting things. Next slide, please. Keep going. Let's see what we get up here. I don't know what we're to All right, we're just going to change the next slide. That works too. Keep going. Keep, let's get something up there. Uh, okay, keep going. You can't play this game now because the slide's not cooperating. A couple of things to pay attention to. Right? Differences in content. The distribution of the content area are the same. The topics for the test are actually the same on both tests. The way you distribute those topics are different. The ACT, if you love geometry, the ACT might be the test for you. If you hate geometry, you might want to stay away from the ACT, right? So they both have geometry, but the SAT has less than 10% geometry, whereas the ACT has 30-something percent, 
right? So being aware of what the tests are, and that's one of the things that the practice gives you. It gives you a sense of what's on each test and which test I'm going to perform better on, right? A lot of students take geometry in 10th grade, so they probably would remember that and maybe not so much algebra. So that might skew that decision as to which test to take, all right? Uh, keep flipping, and we'll go past this. We won't look at this now. Keep going for me. All right, so with writing the same thing, it's all the same within the multiple choice writing section. All the topics are fundamentally the same. The essay is optional on both. Let me say that better. When you sign up for the test, they give you the option as to whether to register for the essay or not. What determines whether a student registers for the essay? Colleges. colleges. The colleges determine whether you write for the essay. If you're applying to the yeshiva and they say, we want the essay, what are you doing? Taking the essay. Most of you don't know the colleges you're applying to yet. So how do you determine whether to take the essay or not? You do it. A lot of you are going to do the essay just in case. If you have your application set, if you know the colleges you're going to apply to, then you can start looking at whether they require the essay or not. But for most of you who don't know your schools, you're going to do a lot of things just in case. You're going to take the essay just in case. Because for both tests, if you don't take the essay, you have to retake the entire test. You cannot just take the essay, all right? So if I'm gonna go in for three hours, I might as well stay that extra hour and get the essay done in case I need it, okay? So most students are going to take the essay anyway. Let's keep flipping. Um, reading, all the stuff is the same on both tests. They're fundamentally the same. The style's a little bit different. Keep going. Um, anything here exciting? That's a little bit about the essay. We don't, we're not gonna spend any time on that. We'll keep going there. Here's our science, right, woohoo! This is weird what the SAT did. The SAT actually embedded charts and graphs in all topics, reading, writing, and math. So the science score you get from the SAT actually comes with science-based questions or reading charts and graphs in math questions or in writing questions. So that's how science shows up in the SAT. Keep going. Here's the big difference between the two tests that I think impacts most students. The ACT is a whole lot faster than the SAT. They give you much less time per question. Although the SAT questions tend to be a little bit more complicated. So there's some give and take in that. But one of the big things is the ACT feels really, really fast. And students tend to be troubled to finish the test. So that may be one factor. If you are a slow, methodical, careful student, the ACT may not be the test for you just because of the speed it requires to get a fair number of questions done. All right, keep flipping. All right, so let's roll through that. Go ahead. What's next? Um, so think about test dates. Um, so they're, most test dates are the same. The ACT is not offered in New York State in February. So if you want to take the ACT in February, it's got to be out of state. Um, but SAT test dates are, are there, what they are. The one that I think most people should pay attention to, I love the August test, which is new. This is the first year. This is the last year they're doing the January test and the first year they're doing an August test. So this coming summer, there's an SAT. I think a great schedule, and change the slide for me, um, a great schedule, oh, this is gonna be a pain because of the flipping. See if you can click it once and see what happens, or once or twice and see what shows up. Um, ideally for me, what's gonna happen is, yeah, I need that too. Your computer doesn't like animations. Um, ideally what'll happen for me is a student would prepare, let's say a student chooses to go SAT. They'll prepare for that May test. And they spend all their time, they prep for that. And maybe, as a backup, if the May test doesn't go well, you do the August test. Because most colleges will take your best subsection from multiple test dates. So if you do better on math in August and better on reading in, in May, they'll take the better reading, the better math, put it together, and call it that student score. All right? Now, the way that works is you don't control the subsections. You cannot send math from May and reading from, from August. You're not allowed to do that. You can send all of May and all of August. You cannot choose subsections to send. Does that make sense? What colleges will do, if you send them two scores, they will cobble them together on their own and call them your score. So for most people, it's beneficial to do more than one test. So ideally what will happen is I take a test in, in May and then my second SAT in August, and then if that doesn't work out for me, I might decide to switch off to the ACT at that point and do a little prep for the ACT. Or if you decide ACT is your primary test, then I would flip that. I would prepare for a spring ACT, maybe do a second ACT in September, and then if that doesn't work out, I switch off to the SAT after that. 
So ideally what happens is most people focus on one test, and if it doesn't work out, then you switch to the other. Preparing for both at the same time doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay? Uh, let's keep flipping. Yeah. So big things, oh man, everything's getting messed up. Let's keep going. Um, darn it. Okay, so keep flipping. So prep, test prep is really going to be about learning how to manage the test. Okay, that's that's one huge thing. The first thing I tell every student I work with is actually to slow down. One thing to look at out of your score reports: how many of you left questions blank at the end of the test? How many of you got a ton of questions wrong at the end of the test? Basic things like that can improve your test taking. What I actually tend to do right away with most students: if you take the SAT, let's say there are 58 math questions. What tends to happen is most kids will answer about half of them right, which will convert to, let's say you get 26 out of 58 SAT math questions right. That converts to about a 500 SAT score. If I slow that child down, and instead of doing 58 questions, I make them do 38 questions, but they get a few more right. They get 34 of those right. Now they already have a higher score because they've gotten more questions correct. And the way you get points on both of these tests is they just count up the questions correct. There is no longer a guessing penalty on the SAT. So if I slow a student down, make them do fewer questions, they get a few more correct, we've got a higher score. But what about the questions they did not answer? Yes, because there's no penalty. So I slow a student down, make them get more right, and then we fill randomly in all the rest of the questions. If you left questions blank on the test, go back into your test, and say, choose your letter of the day, and see how many of those you get right. right? In math, each question right is about worth of almost 10 points. So you can start looking at, what could I have gotten out of this test? Had I slowed down, was more careful in the beginning, and then guessed at the end. And basic stuff like that is the starting point of preparing for the test, just having that type of information. So that's the first thing I tend to do with most of my students, making sure they're taking the test in a better way. And then we start to learn other stuff like, plugging in and all sorts of strategies for handling the questions that are actually on the test. Learning the types of stuff that appear on the test, such as in reading, if you don't like science, well the SAT is actually really structured in its reading passages. The first one it gives you is a founding document, then it's social science, then it's science, then it's a history passage, then the last one's a science. Well if my students know that, I'm gonna take a kid who doesn't like science and I'm gonna tell them skip the third and the fifth passage. Let's focus on all the others, get those all right, rack up my points on non-science stuff, and then worry about the science at the end. So different things like that are what makes for good test taking. Understanding the structure and the patterns of the test, and then turning that into information you can use. And learning things like formulas and all of the rules. Let's flip, flip, flip. Let's see what comes up next. So basic things, right? Um, so we have courses, and you've got, got information on that. There's a fundamentals course here in the building, which will include four practice tests. We have longer courses that don't occur in the building. Um, and you can look for information on that on our website. And then we'll flip once more. If you can see it at the bottom there, Jody is our outreach manager who is in charge of the school. And she will be available to answer questions and give all sorts of information anytime you need it. Her email address is there. If you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. General, well, so with doing nothing at all, you probably won't see very much improvement. Maybe 30 points, I think, is, is the average growth that tends to happen from one test to another. Also, be careful about those things because if you actually look at your reports, a lot of them will give you a score range. A 510 is actually not a 510. The SAT has a plus minus 30 points, which means a 510 is effectively a 540 because if you turn around tomorrow and take the test, you get one or two more questions right or wrong, so you could get a 540 instead. Right? So taking any test, if you get a 510, I expect that, that same student, if they took it tomorrow, might get anywhere from minus 30 points to plus 30 points on that. Does that make sense? The second part of that is, with preparation, I generally expect 100 or so points, at least out of a class. Right? Out of tutoring, depending on how many hours they do, depending on how much work, I might expect more. Right? So as a benchmark for me, with someone who does serious prep, I'm probably expecting at least 100 points. All right, for the SAT. For the ACT, probably thinking more in like the three-point range. Okay. Other questions? How do we know that schools uh, look at ACT and SAT and 
because I've asked every school in the country and they've told me they do. <laughs> right? Then it's no longer like 15 years ago, they cared about which one. It's no longer the case at all. There, there was one school left a couple years ago who only wanted ACT, but it's no longer the case. Everybody's good with either one. Okay. Other questions? All right, well, if I've got all the questions, then thanks for playing, and I hope I've given you some information, and have a good night.